Welcome back, everyone, for our final formal session of the afternoon. I'd like to take this time, this opportunity to introduce Mr. Chris Burgess, Project Director with the Islands team at RMI. <clears throat> Chris works closely with the Department of Energy and others to support the government of Bermuda's rooftop solar procurement. And Chris does similar work in nine other jurisdictions across the Caribbean. Chris's panel will explore the needs of the electricity grid from the coming electrification of transportation and how it might be able to benefit from that transition. So with that, over to you, Chris. Thanks, CJ. Uh, it is my pleasure to be here at the Bermuda Electric Mobility Summit. I know a lot of hard work went into this from the government of Bermuda. I'd like to personally thank Aaron um, for, for establishing this summit and, and facilitating the, uh, the webinar. Uh, it's been very, very uh, well attended and I've been listening in throughout the day. Um, really advanced conversations. I'm, I'm really impressed with um, this jurisdiction's uh, commitment to renewables and EVs. Um, I don't know why the moderators or the, uh, the uh, organizers picked me last for enabling infrastructure because I guess infrastructure is one of the most boring topics you can have. Uh, when I think of exciting EVs, I think of my Ford F-150 Lightning at a tailgate. Uh, that's exciting, or a, or a Tesla Model S in insanity mode. You know, th those are exciting EV stories. Enabling infrastructure, not so much, but luckily we've got a, a steam panel uh, to bring that excitement to the boring topic of infrastructure. Um, first, we have uh, the famous uh, Joanna uh, Edshill from Megapower. Uh, she goes by Joe. Uh, she's the co-founder and director of Megapower Limited in Barbados. She formed Megapower Limited in February 2013 after recognizing a distinct market opportunity for electrified transport powered by renewables. Uh, Megapower's vision is for a network of publicly available charging stations powered by renewable uh, energy sources, enabled, enabling the rapid uptake of electric vehicles in Barbados and throughout the Caribbean. Megapower is now seen as the Caribbean's leading electric vehicle specialist garage operating across the region. And I'd like to commend her uh, on all the progress she's had in Barbados uh, and, you know, being featured in, in many worldwide publications, in, including Forbes. Uh, so uh, very excited to have Joe with us. Uh, second, we have Fabian uh, Gentles from, uh, from Belco. Um, Fabian is, is a rock star there with the utility. Uh, a power system engineer currently serving as the system planning manager in grid operations uh, for Belco. He's responsible for many, many things for the company, including coordinating and conducting the planning studies necessary to optimize and maintain safety, security, and reliability, um, as well as bulk transport, transmission distribution, uh, retail licensing. Uh, he's also responsible for leading the integration of new capital projects such as the first utility scale solar uh, farm over there in Solar Finger, about a six megawatt plant, uh, as well as the international, um, as well as the, uh, the new public electric uh, bus fleet. So really happy to have Fabian with us as well. Uh, we'll be hearing a presentation from Mr. Chris King of Siemens. Chris is the uh, e-mobility strategic um, partner. Part, he's a partner there at Siemens leading the uh, ecosystem and regulatory initiatives globally. Chris's board participation includes advanced energy economy with my friend H.G. Chazelle, uh, Smart Electric Power Association and Smart Energy Europe. Chris has testified before Congress, several states and international policymakers. He holds a bachelor's and a master's degree in science from Stanford and a doctorate in law. Uh, so really happy to have Chris King with us uh, as we close out this afternoon's session. Uh, and last but not least, we have James Jean Louis from Zoom EV. Uh, James is an e-mobility specialist and entrepreneur for the last 30 years. Um, and he's been at the senior management director level in automotive industry the last 10, um, most of which have been dedicated to electric vehicles, uh, charging and the infrastructure sector. Um, so great. So I'm really happy to have this panel with us. This afternoon, I think we will kick off. Who's kicking us off here? Is that going to be Chris?
Sure, be happy to. Sorry, I had to unmute there. Thanks, Chris. Uh, thanks, thanks for the great introduction, Chris. Uh, I'm gonna share my screen now. And um, put up the PowerPoint presentation. I've got about a dozen slides here. I'll go through them fairly quickly. Chris, before you get moving, we can definitely see your screen. Um, we, you know, we're the, the pleasure of going last, we also run against time, right? So we want to make sure that this presentation stays within, you know, the, the seven to nine minute mark. So you leave some room for James and then we want to have a, a nice dialogue as opposed to a monologue later on. Thanks, Chris. Exactly. So just diving right in, we're at Siemens in this whole space. We're a technology provider. So we provide chargers of all different types for all different vehicles, design and build capability. Um, and software and services to go along with that. One thing that Siemens is proud of is that we committed to being a net zero corporation. We were one of the first major, probably the first major industrial company to do that uh, by 2030, actually. So we're, and, and we're actually 50% of the way there. One thing that is exciting, Chris, you mentioned infrastructure is not so exciting, but we'll, one thing that is exciting about EVs is what they do for all ratepayers. And this slide shows where the dollars would go if you had an ICE vehicle compared to where the dollars would go if you had an electric vehicle. And if with the electric vehicle, first of all, the EV driver is saving about half the, of what they otherwise would have spent for fueling. But another thing that's really good about this is that EVs are putting more electrons through the existing power grid. And EV drivers are paying for those electrons. And so that money is going into uh, to support the grid but if you can do that without increasing the peak, you actually provide savings for all ratepayers because very little extra cost and yet you have this extra revenue that's become available. So when you do see that F-150 Lightning driving by, you can be thankful that they are helping you even though you don't own the EV because they're helping support the grid. Now what happens if you don't manage charging? We did a simulation, this is for a town in Germany and you can see this huge, almost 400% increase in the peak load based on people just coming in and charging randomly with no, uh, no smart charging capability. So EVs can be a problem for the grid, but they can, you know, like I said, they can be a huge benefit through the increased throughput. And what do you need for smart charging to make sure that you can keep them off peak? You need chargers that have data communications, the ability to control them remotely, and the ability to measure what's going on within them so you can report back and track what's going on. Fairly simple uh, from a um, conceptual perspective. Now, another key thing beyond smart charging to make this infrastructure effective and avoid additional costs and actually minimize costs is interoperability. Uh, make sure any vehicle can work with any charger, make sure any charger can work with any, any back office network, make sure any consumer going to a public station can actually pay for it and they're not stuck in some proprietary network. I mean, interoperability reduces costs. Stranded assets is, is a real issue in this industry. We, there are cases where EVSPs have put out networks of, of uh, chargers and then they pulled out of the market. This happened recently in Australia. And so interoperability protects customer choice. And when we say interoperability, what are we talking about? We're talking about a couple of key interfaces. Um, one of them is uh, between data centers. So you can have the utility talking to private providers and sharing data and optimizing systems. Another one is between the charger and the consumer, getting that data. Uh, through, whether it's through Wi-Fi or some inter other internet connection. Another is between the vehicle and the charger where you need a standard so you can be able to do things like vehicle to grid applications. And uh, F-150 is a, another great example there where one of the key use cases there is providing backup power to the home. So from a policy perspective, to sort of sum up these points that I've been highlighting, um, chargers should be smart so we can manage them. Um, we've got that definition of smart charger that I went through. 
it's communicating. It uh, can speak to the back end IT systems. It's got a meter in it. Um, open standards enable that interoperability, the customer choice, lower cost that I talked about. And then there are a number of examples uh, in the US of states that are requiring this interoperability. And I'll close out with a quick, uh, great little program that's being offered by the Northern States Power in Minnesota. Um, they're focusing on home charging, which is where 80% of charging typically happens. And they've got something that we like to call the easy button program where you buy your car, you call the utility, they come and install a charger for you. And at 17 bucks a month, that covers the charger. You own it after three years. And for 26 bucks a month, you get all the electricity you need. It's a subscription program. So there are some other examples of that, but this is a really uh, cool program to take a look at for consumers. So with that, uh, I'll wind up and turn it back to you, Chris, so we can move on. Thanks, Chris. Yeah, I love the easy button concept. Um, and thanks for your, your general overview and um, you know bringing in some European and some American perspectives on, on infrastructure, which all the islands can certainly learn from, but not completely adopt, given the fact that um, you know all the islands in the Caribbean are their own ISOs, right? They're their own grids, and they can't lean back on you know, the largest electricity market in the Western Hemisphere, such as PJM, uh, to worry about capacity and, and um, a stability on the line. So our next speaker is, is Fabian from Belco, and he's going to speak about the Bermuda context when, uh, when it comes to enabling infrastructure. All right. Hello. Good afternoon. Are you hearing me, Chris? Yes. Loud and clear, buddy. All right, lovely. Let me try and pull up my slides. Yep, they're up, man. You're up? All right, good. Let me just maximize. Yeah. All right, so good Good afternoon, everyone. Um, thanks for your time today, and thanks for the invite to be here to, to sort of speak through um, enabling infrastructure and just some of the thoughts from the, from the Belco standpoint. I'll jump right into things. Now, just to give a sort of quick overview in terms of the Belco service territory, um, I think everyone's aware Belco is a very small island. It's about 21 square miles, which does make the island ideal for e-mobility. In terms of the, the electric, well, in terms of the vehicles on island, um, as you'll see probably on the right, um, there's probably 40,000 plus vehicles on island at the moment. Um, which that does present an opportunity for, for, for e-mobility. There is some charging infrastructure, and I basically just pull a bit of that information, which is what I'm representing um, in the lower portion of the L2 um, charging pedestals. Now, importantly, in terms of the, the grid, which is what I want to especially focus on, um, the, the, the install capacity for um, on the island is around 140 megawatts. That's what plant install capacity is. The peak loading on the system is about 102, which was that's a peak load from last year. There are 6.8 megawatt, there's 6.8 megawatt of distributed behind the meter solar PV installed in Ber Bermuda right now. There's also a six megawatt solar PV scale plant that is upcoming um, very shortly to be commissioned onto the in, onto the grid. Um, and there's also a utility, there's a utility scale um, best or battery energy storage system. It's a 10 megawatt system at five megawatt hours. It's installed at the central plant as well. And I have some information here around the trans transmission voltages are 22 and 33 kV. There's about 211 kilometers of network. There's a distribution, which is our primary overhead distribution, one six. It's about 180 kilometers. Um, and in terms of residential customers on the island, there's about 32,000 um, customers. So that's just a kind of the layout Bermuda context and what Bermuda um, service territory looks like. Now, in terms of what I want to discuss or get into today, when we talk about e-mobility, one of the bigger focus from the utility and from the planning standpoint uh, is not just EVs, EVs are a part of a broader picture around distributed energy resources. And that's sort of the lens that, that we, we tend to look from. And that's, that's mostly the perspective I'm going to speak from 
this afternoon. In, this, in the previous slide, I shared that there, there is um, solar PV on island, rooftop solar PV. There's about 6.8. That number does continue to grow. Um, we do have the grid scale solar plant that is on the way. We do also have um, the large scale energy storage utility scale. And I expect that even in the coming, in the coming years or so, we will eat our energy storage on the island as well. So when we talk about enabling infrastructure um, for e-mobility, it's not strictly just for EVs and the like. We're talking about all the distributed um, resource technologies that that infrastructure will need to accommodate or to allow the transition of. Now, in terms of the, the, the typical expectations around um, e-mobility, we know that customers, there's certainly a greater interest um, in, in having um, improved service standards around electricity grids, particularly as the, as the network transitions to more renewables to a more sustainable future. Now, typically, um, in terms of the, the, the historical um, outcomes for, for the electric network have typically been focused on reliability and safety. We do find that as we make this transition to more renewables, to a more digitized network, to a more decentralized network, to a more decarbonized network, the tenants that are playing within how we look at um, um, energy, in, in terms of how we look at um, enabling infrastructure. Some of those are, are also security, flexibility, resiliency, clean energy, and, and also a focus on cost and affordability. Now, in terms of in terms of infrastructure, as I mentioned, um, customers' interests are evolving. We do see that there are there are new sort of operational risks um, that are presenting themselves, which do change how we look at um, enabling infrastructure and the investments around that. There is also um, certainly an increase in terms of DERs, which does present some work as well. And we do realize also that there is there are great that are also um, creating new opportunities in terms of the TND work streams. Now, all of this is significant for us because as we, we talk about enabling infrastructure, the, the, the significant thing for the utility is to look at grid modernization. Grid modernization effectively is tied to the enabling infrastructure. And the grid modernization, it's a term that's pretty broad in its context, but we're going to speak a little bit about some of what that means for the, from the utility standpoint this afternoon. Now, the first question is, what's grid modernization? Basically, this is a process of upgrading the existing grid infrastructure and incorporating new technologies to, to make the grid smarter. There's certainly been a lot of dialogue and literature out there around smart grid. This is certainly something that we, we have to factor and incorporate in terms of how we look at um, the enabling infrastructure. And what is smart grid? Smart grid is, is mostly, it's a digital technology that will allow for two-way communication between the utility and its customers and allow for sensing and monitoring along our TND networks to optimize how the network is used by our customer. And basically what you're seeing in terms of the, the diagram before us, what we're looking at in terms of how the network is going to evolve, we expect there are going to be more EVs on the network, which you can see here. There will be distributed resources, um, but there will need to be that infrastructure that sits behind all of these resources to, one, allow power to flow, because we, we do expect that as there are increased EVs on the network, the loading on the network will increase. So we will have to upgrade our network infrastructure, our transmission and distribution circuits in order to allow that power to flow, in order to minimize any possibility of congestion. We expect as well that we will have to um, improve um, the deployment of our communication networks. There will be a lot more communication taking place between the utility customer within this new um, utility 2.0 and we will need to deploy technologies that allow us to have that communication. Now, once we start having this communication, there will be more data that will be aggregated on with, within the, the US. So there will be need for new technologies that incorporate more controls. There will be need for technology that will allow us to 
to also to also have the intelligence to make useful decisions around all this information that is coming back to us. And there will also be need to, to make this information accessible to the customers. We, we certainly live in a time where are using smartphones um, significantly more and there is generally a greater expectation from our customers to get more data um, in terms of how their energy usage is. So, so this is just a sort of diagram that lays out what that looks like. Now, you know, as I talk about grid modernization and, and enabling infrastructure, from the utility standpoint, this has to be customer focused. You know, all of these different technologies and these offerings that we're, we're, we're interested in and look the intention is that this is all supposed to be in line with the customer's demands and the customer's interests. And certainly, I would say from the, the, the Belco and the Liberty standpoint, that is heavily our focus and, and that's heavily the mandate that, that we've been given. Now, in terms of the, the, the diagram that I'm showing before you, these are it's just a representation of the different systems that we'll have to look at evolving as we as we incorporate EVs, as we incorporate more DERs. So what you see in there, from the operation standpoint, there's the need for us to improve some of our systems. And this is a part of our enabling infrastructure. So from our, from our standpoint, we will need to look at how we incorporate um, AMI data. We are we're currently deploying AMI on island and that's, I think that's relatively close to being finalized. We'll have to also be using new technologies around um, automated distribution management systems. I think that's going to be a big area because for us, because certainly as you have more EVs on the island, as you have more PVs, BES, we will need systems that will allow us to not only aggregate that data, but also to have some intelligence to make useful decisions around that data. A lot of that will also factor back into how we look at forecasting on the network. Um, and certainly the AMI solution is another option for us to leverage where that is concerned. And, you know, as we talk about this, probably just a little bit further, in terms of the grid modernization to, to accommodate these different technologies, it's not just strictly from an operation standpoint, it's also from the, from, the, from the billing and the customer standpoint as well, which is what you're seeing represented here. So in terms of how I would say I, or from the planning standpoint, we look at um, the enabling infrastructure, it's, it's a comprehensive sort of look it's not strictly just upgrading portions of the network or upgrading TND. It's also the systems that we're using. It's the capacity of our, of our persons internally and the training that they will need to be able to systems. It's also how we'll interact with customers as you have all of these changes taking place on the network. Now, the, the final hey, slide. David, uh, just giving you, a, just, that was my alarm for just about a two minute warning, bud. All right, no problem. Okay. So all right. This is actually the final slide. Perfect. So the thing is, this was a valid proposition for e-mobility um, as we talk about um, enabling infrastructure and grid modernization. So one, we expect that there will be smart charging that will be used for, for EVs going forward. And what that will allow is, is, is a few things. One, there will be the option or the, there will be the opportunity to have dynamic pricing and electricity prices. So with charging will have the ability to use time of use rates we'll have probably public charge that we'll also be able to incorporate um, also there's the, the integration with grid edge technology this is especially focused on ami incorporation and um, there'll be new from charging there'll be the opportunity to lower cost to serve peak loads because certainly with smart charging there's a there's an opportunity to do um, load shifting and demand response um, we'll also be able to better um, utilize our assets um, just based on the amount of information that will be coming into the utility. There's an opportunity for new investments. So we already know that there will be new charging infrastructure. Um, we'll certainly need to do upgrades to our substations and our feeder circuits because there will be increased load on our circuits. Um, and also there's an opportunity to, to look at improving some of our aged assets and, and also look at how we can make as we upgrade some of these assets. The next point I would say there, there are new services that we expect that will come out of this. So there will be new business models to support some of the owners, um, also to provide real-time intelligence to customers. 
just to facilitate new sorts of interactions between the grid operator and customers. Um, the, the next point is additional load. Um, so there's expectation that we will have more revenues once there is more load on the network. And that also gives us the opportunity to, to eventually uh, be able to lower electricity rates because there's less pressure um, in terms of revenue requirements once there's, once there's a volume of load to spread that revenue across. Um, I'd say the final point is, is ancillary services. And you know what this is, is basically once we have these larger EV fleet and operators around the island, there's an opportunity for, for them to supply um, their own demand or even supply um, power back into the grid. Um, I'll, I'll wrap up there just because I'm, I'm mindful of the time. Thanks, Fabian. And that's very, it. very, very informative. Thank you very much. Um, I'm sure your voice will be heard throughout this, this dialogue that, um, that I want to provoke now. Um, you know, it's great to have uh, leadership from Barbados here with us because um, everyone in the Caribbean is looking at them as some of the early adopters, uh, particularly when you come to, you know, personal vehicles and being able to, to charge those economically there in um, Barbados. So I, I want to turn to Jo and um, just invite her to, to share, you know, her experience with enabling infrastructure there in Barbados where you have quite a number of, uh, of personal EVs. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, Chris, do you hear me okay? Perfectly. Great, okay, thank you for having me this afternoon. And also thanks for having James John Louis because it makes my work a lot easier. He's been a mentor to Megapower and to me personally since starting the business in 2013. So it's great to have him on the line here today. I will share my screen. I have uh, five quick slides, but really it's just to start the conversation. It's, it's not, not a presentation as such. So let me do that now. Um, hopefully this, ooh, there. And Joe, since you, you've got the personal relationship with James, feel free to put him on the spot at any given time. <laughs> I will. All right. Um, James, James and I have been to the UK while well, he lives there, Jamaica and Barbados together. Um, this is giving me a little bit of trouble to share my screen. I do have a new computer, which is maybe part of it. Do you have the slides I would have sent? Yes, yeah, I believe. I can ours. start speaking in, in any case. Yes. Yeah. Um, I visited Bermuda in 2011 before I formed Megapower, um, but my memory of it, and especially at 21 square miles, and given Barbados is 166 square miles, considerably bigger, although still very small, um, I don't see why what we've done here in terms of changing the driving landscape and rolling out charging infrastructure could be any different, if not faster and quicker for Bermuda to, to achieve. Um, so this is the final, or the, if we could start at the, at the top of the yeah, slide. Yeah, that's the fourth slide. Yeah, if we could start at the yeah. top, there you go. Great, okay. Um, so this is a photo actually of one of our chargers supplied by James. It's a double outlet charging point, and this is a Nissan Leaf plugged in. Um, so this is an illustration of what we're doing here in Barbados. What you can't see from the photo is it's under a solar carport. And Megapower's vision has been and continues to be to promote the uptake of electric vehicles powered by um, renewable energy. And what we have in Barbados in terms of enabling that and linked to enabling infrastructure is from our government, we have a clear energy policy, which includes electric mobility and which includes looking to the year 2030 to be 100% um, renewable generation. And I mean, that's a big statement piece, um, how we're gonna get there. Uh, there are some actions to, to get there, um, but certainly having that from the government um, has really been enabling for the business. We also have a very active electric utility and it's a sole utility um, similar to, to Bermuda. And so in that sense, you know, when you have the, well, key players really, the government and the electric utility on board for um, electric vehicle uptake, it, it's been tremendous. And if I look to Megapower's last quarter sales, I'm seeing that with the government as well. So 25% of our sales has gone to government entities in the last quarter. 
Hey, Joe, just, just a question on the charging infrastructure there. As you said, it's under the, the canopy. Um, is it safe to assume that the, the canopy in Barbados is kind of a buy all sell all? Or is that is that sort of okay. off grid? Um, no, however, outside of my office, we have taken a five kilowatt peak system um, off grid and it's linked to a 15 kilowatt hour and um, old 2012 Nissan Leaf modules that we created a battery pack um, from. So we're trialing that in the office and I've got five ACs, a fridge, a dishwasher, kettle, um, microwave, et cetera. Typical office, office stuff that's powered mm -hmm. by solar. Um, but the one in the photo um, is not. But what we've been looking to do with the batteries is the potential to repurpose them as well as to link them to the charging infrastructure. This is a very quick snapshot. So this is, is where we are now. Um, so roughly 50% of our operational transport board public bus fleet is now electric. And that's happened um, in the last year. So that's really, really new to Barbados. So there are about 90 buses in operation. Um, it, that should grow to about 130, but 49 of them are the BYD K8RA. And at all the bus terminals, or the three major bus terminals where the buses sleep overnight, there's a charging point allocated per bus. Um, as the fleet expands, there might be some sharing and we might look to, you know, what is the most optimum charging infrastructure for the buses in order to manage, again, the demand, the buses come into the terminal at midnight, they all plug in, you know, what does that look like for our island grid? So that's all still being figured out, but there are 49 now here. In the last year as well, we've introduced the MG ZS, which is a mid-size electric SUV. And what we've done, I guess, in the last year, which was different to previous years, is that we included a complimentary home charger in the sale of the vehicle. And that's really bolstered the uptake of charging infrastructure in persons' homes or, or at their residential locations. And again, we're data capturing for the utility, you know, what is the, um, the bill number? What is the poll number? How do we try and sync this with time to do things like vehicle to grid um, and to really optimize the benefits of, of electric vehicles and stabilizing the grid? Hey, Joe, um, real, real quick on the buses, um, you know, we work closely with um, Bermuda, um, you know, the Bermuda e mobility team there at the government. And, you know, they're just, uh, now waiting for their buses to be delivered, I think, in, at the end of the year, or early January. Um, it seems that uh, Barbados is ahead. Right? You already have uh, just about a little over half of the bus fleet um, already electric. Any, any ideas um, on the, 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 the Delta? So uh, I said you, you think you have 90 buses. So I guess um, when are the rest of the buses going to go electric? Are there plans for those as well? Well, the original order was for 33, and then it was an additional, so the 33 arrived in August um, or July 2020, and then an, an additional two were purchased um, about April of this year, and then um, the 14 landed June or July of this year. So there has been, the government has, you know, from the initial Subsequ subsequently just keep buying, up to yeah? 49 within the year i mean that's, that's so is happened. it safe to say for the for the spirit of competitiveness that barbados will beat bermuda and electrifying their uh, their bus fleet 100 percent. there we go <laughs> chuck ej aaron let's go <laughs> all right Jeff. Is, uh... um what i will say is that the support that we've had from byd has been tremendous and we looked at many different manufacturers for the buses. And indeed it was a government decision. It wasn't, you know, mega powers decision, but I've toured many factories. I've toured about four bus factories. Um, maybe something about me, I love a factory tour. <laughs> um, but the support that we've had from BYD has been tremendous. We've had Chinese technicians in Barbados since August, 2020, um, you know, rotating. And the training that they've delivered both to the transport board, to first responders, so, so police, um, ambulance, paramedics, et cetera, and, and to our technicians as well has been incredible. So guys, maybe maybe try a BYD bus. That's, that's my plug for BYD. Um, 
and then kind of jumping back on to this to this photo uh, is the the Nissan electric vans, which have been very popular as courier. Um, so DHL, for example, Flow, the telecommunications company, are driving these vans. Um, and linked to that, and it's a question that I get often, which is, okay, so my vehicle comes with a charging unit, but you do have this public charging network. Why should I plug in not at home? Why should I plug into your network? And what we found is about 75% of our sales have been business to business. And quite often the employee or the driver of that vehicle doesn't want to charge at home um, because of the inconvenience maybe of then onward billing back to the company versus being used to having maybe a gasoline card. And so our charging network by having these, these cards that you can access publicly takes that away. But I guess that's also a conversation for the electric utility as to how billing of public charging could maybe become part of the utility bill and you know stuff like that might make sense. James is going to talk to this, right? James, James has run um, and rolled out many networks in the UK. So with small islands, there really isn't the space um, for more than one network, I don't believe, but certainly um, in the UK, in Europe, in North America, there will be many, many charging networks. Yeah. That's true. Hi, guys. I'll just jump in there. Hi, I'm James Jean-Louis. I'm currently speaking to you from an EV event. Um, every year there has been held the low carbon vehicle event um, in the middle of England. Last year we didn't have it. Um, so we're in the middle of a two day event and I've spent all day talking about electric vehicles and infrastructure. And I'm currently in a hotel, so excuse the background, but I'm really delighted to have been invited to come and share my thoughts with you in terms of um, what, you know, what things should be considered. And it's been an absolute pleasure working with Joe and Megapower and the team um, to supply and support with the charging infrastructure and indeed as, as we grow forward and one of the uh, tasks I have been doing today is looking at the next generation of charging equipment that we're planning to bring over to the Caribbean over, over to Barbados particularly and I think I'm going back, um, I, I've had over 30 years in the automotive sector and the last 10 years have been dedicated to electric vehicles. I actually started one of the very first charge point supply and installation companies here in the UK when you can actually count the number of cars that were available on one hand, i.e. five, and three of them were the same car. They were the Mitsubishi Aimeev, which was also a Citroen and a Peugeot. So effectively, that just makes it three cars that were available. And now every car manufacturer that you can think of has a plug-in or a full electric um, offering, not just across their badge, but across all the levels within, within, the, within their range, which just shows where we're going. We're now over a quarter of a million pure electric vehicles here in the UK, and this market here is on fire. However, when it comes to charging, the actual perception of range, how long it takes to charge a car, and all of the things we, we must take into consideration. And Joe's absolutely right about particularly with fleet vehicles where the driver, and I know with some of the discussions I've had with you guys in, in Bermuda, we've talked specifically about taxi fleets and what I call last mile delivery. So Joe referred to DHL and, and courier fleets. And even, even in the UK, we have florist fleets of flower companies that deliver flowers electrically and milk. Um, but most of these drivers are professional drivers, and Joe's absolutely right. They won't want to use their energy at home. The reality in the UK currently is that over 90% of all the EVs do charge at home. Um, I drive a full electric car. I do more than 90% of my charging at home. And um, just interesting, at this hotel that I'm at today, it was a real surprise and a pleasure to find there was a charging point outside the parking area where I was able to plug in my car and not even think about charging as we go on. But these are things that, you know, separately we, we can think about. But there's definitely, from a on-the-go charging and a professional fleet charging, where you need to think about the um, 
about the recharging and how the driver has access and the availability and more importantly the location of those charge points and these are things that i've worked closely with joe and her team to help um, implement as 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 best as we can so go back to 2013 when i first started to supply charging points to uh, barbados now the equipment that we're looking at bringing over to barbados actually has twice the output power so currently around barbados they're charging from 50 kilowatt chargers but we've seen the growth joe's on the screen now i see the number of cars that are currently driving around barbados um, the next generation of chargers are coming in will actually be able to rapid charge that's charging sort of, you know in 80 percent in 20 minutes or less depending on the charging technology of the vehicle. Now we're looking at those similar sized units in terms of footprint, but we'll be able to charge two cars at the same time. For, so for taxi fleets and courier drivers and delivery drivers, which what we've been focusing on, this is a real game changer in terms of the space you need. However, it's really been interesting to listen to the the power availability and generation on you in your country because we have to factor all of these things in because it's all very well me saying you need to double the output of your charger but then of course you need double the power to to power it so there's there's so many considerations that have to be taken um but just looking at where we are in what is relatively a very short space of time number one vehicle technology has changed the Nissan Leaf that Joe first brought into Barbados in 2013 probably had a range of something like, probably more in Barbados because it's a, a warmer country, but here in the UK where we have cold and wind and wet, it was a lot less. So you were lucky if you got, I remember driving a 2013 Nissan Leaf and I was lucky if I got 80 miles of range. The latest car, which is exactly the same size, okay, maybe a more up-to-date shape, but the footprint of the battery pack, so the envelope of the battery pack is exactly the same. And that car's range now has more than three times the original range in a very short space of time. So it just shows what technology is coming in with the cars. The good thing for an island like Bermuda, of course, then, is if you're only 20, did we say 20 miles or? Uh, 23. You know, 23. So actually, in terms of range and the new vehicles that are available, the charging requirements and the charging frequency, by definition, once the car's charged, are actually going to be less because you'll have to go around the island a few times, I guess, to, to do 250 miles. Um, so these are all things that are in favour of a nation like Bermuda in terms of the amount of charges you have and, and where you have them. However, if we stick with the topic of fleets, depot charging, so uh, the transport board in, in um, Barbados, DHL Couriers Yard, the customers that Megapower have supplied vehicles for, a lot of those actually have what we call depot charging. So they're on site at the depot for only the use of the drivers of those vehicles there. And then when they are going around the island, as, as Joe says, they are available for the use of, of these drivers. However, they're also available for the use of the public, um, the public users as well. So there are so many things to consider, but technology in the last five years certainly has changed dramatically that improves the efficiency of the vehicles, reduces the number of times you need to charge. And as I say, Bermuda has such a, an opportunity to drive further, but getting that technology right, the network right in terms of recharging, the type of equipment that you use, um, there are so many things that need to be considered that actually are in the favour of Bermuda as you enter this e-mobility process now, rather than say back in 2013 when Joe and her team learnt by, um, you know, just learnt by by doing it and and understanding what was needed. So there's a huge amount of experience, particularly from Megapower, that 
can support you guys in on the island at Bermuda um, to have a really cool, efficient, um, and, and useful network for the, the rapid growth of e-mobility in Bermuda. Speaking of the network, James, I think it's it's important. You know, um, your perspective and Joe's perspective on the on the client side, on the actual driver and the charging, are incredibly important for user uptake and the transition. But you know, I've been working with um, the Carolec utilities in the Caribbean for a long time. And, you know, they are not the same in terms of a continental, you know, utility. So uh, they really have to understand every electron uh, and really every minute of capacity that they have to provide. And I'd like to hear more from, you know, Fabian and Chris and perhaps Joe and yourself, uh, James, on what uh, the utility should be doing to forecast EV adoption what should they be doing to uh, perhaps invest in infrastructure, as as uh, Fabian had noted, for um, the readiness of, of EV charging from a capacity standpoint and really a cost standpoint? I think um, there was a situation in Bermuda where you know charging the buses at night would invoke um, a capacity charge, which would be a little bit detrimental to the economics. So we talk about you know time of use and putting vehicles on the grid that are in are in a in a fleet that could be favorable to the utility and favorable to their dispatch, which again has to be all self control because they can't lean back on a big transmission network and just pull cheap power down the middle of the night, right? They have to generate every electron themselves. So I'd like to start that conversation because we only have about four more minutes um, before I have to hand this back over. Oh gosh, where to start? Um, <laughs> I'll, I'll take cost sharing. I'll let um, James or maybe the utility talk about uh, utility matters and, and the grid. But in terms of getting across a charging network that is focused on the customer, you know, where do people actually want to charge? I think cost sharing for us has been critical. So both in terms of cost sharing with the electric utility, but then also looking to other private sector, um, striking agreements, charging infrastructure agreements with landlords, looking to the hotels whereby charging infrastructure can help them hit some of their green um, targets as to, to get different um, certification and such. But really it's that partnership that has made rolling out. And in Barbados, we have 35 publicly accessible charging points. And that wouldn't have been possible without partnership, both in terms of the electric utility who funded 75% of our um, Chadamo ultra chargers, which are the ones that will charge to 80% in 20 minutes, um, to then private sector as well, whereby mega power will put the charging unit there. But we expect the private sector to either give some or all of the power, run the cabling and the concrete foundation or some of the infrastructure mm -hmm. to come from them. And then that gives buy-in to the partnership as well, where we're putting chargers where the landlords want it and where we're saying, okay, we're gonna maintain and support this. Well, let's go back to, uh, I think what Denton had mentioned, um, you know, the residential community is robust and strong in Bermuda. Um, I think James, you mentioned that 90 plus percent of EG charging is done at home. You could easily imagine a situation where uh, the hardworking people from Bermuda go home, um, they plug in their vehicle, they turn on a kettle, they may turn on the AC, and there's an enormous slug of capacity requirements at that, you know, whatever it is, 5.30, yeah. 6 p.m., 7 p.m. Yeah. How does a utility plan for that? Can I just before before and it's it's a good question for the utility guys, but here in the UK, there's a huge drive to introduce smart charging. So um, and, and the energy companies are providing home energy tariffs and some business tariffs that actually encourage charging at off peak times. And as you rightly say, everybody gets home after work. They plug in the car at the same time that the cooker goes on, people have an electric shower and, 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 and all the, all the consumable stuff goes on in, in their home. Um, there's a huge drive in the UK um, to, to stop that and indeed encourage people to charge at, so for example, between midnight and 5 a.m., for example. And 
as part of that, we're very fortunate here in the UK to have really strong government support with funding. Even home charging is supported. We currently have a home electric vehicle charging grant fund, and that gives every homeowner 350 British pounds against the cost of the supply and installation of their charger on condition that they fit a smart charger that enables their charger to be able to link with a smart energy tariff. So, and there are a number of energy providers here in the UK that then enables them to charge between midnight and 5 a.m. or, or whatever the low cost. Let, let me ask you, so I get home um, in, my, in my Tesla mm -hmm. um, and, the, and the battery still has 50% charge. Yep. I plug in, but the smart charger um, is communicating with the utility. You, and the car. Yeah. yeah, and the car. And the utility basically says, no, Chris, you're not charging your vehicle right now. Exactly. You're 50% and we need yeah. it for other purposes. I, it keeps plugged in. It's locked. And then at yeah. you know, 12.01, my vehicle yeah. starts to charge when the utility is ready. Is that yeah. happening now? Exactly, exactly that. And and um, I, I drive a, a Jaguar I-Pace, a full electric Jaguar currently. I, I actually tell my app that comes with the car that's linked to my charger, what time do I need my car again? So, um, I mean, I, people say to me, how long does it take to charge my car? And I say one minute. And they go, wow, you must have a really fast charger. I say, no, I plug it in and I go to sleep. So that's all I have to do. This, the clever or the smart charging now uh, that, that's available means that I tell my car or my app that's linked to my utility company. Um, in this case, it's, it's, it's an energy company called Octopus Energy. And it actually tells the, the car, the app tells the energy company that I need my car at 7 a.m. Or it may be 11 a.m. in the morning. And, and the utility company then says, right, the demand for that night and the peaks are going to be, as you say, six o'clock is going to be the peak. Um, so let's charge that car, even maybe full power between midnight and five, reduce power when there's, but to make sure that the power, um, the graph, if you like, of that power, um, the estimate of usage over that time is is taken into account. So yeah, you're absolutely right. It's 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 very smart and intelligent charger that links utility to car to charger, and that's that's what we're seeing here. And well, the next gener the next generation. Can sorry, I, can I jump in here? Yeah. Um, we we've been talking about technology a lot, and I want to come in with what I think is a practical suggestion for. Bermuda, which is uh, mm. another best practice, which California is doing, which is simply putting a plan together, putting that forecast together. When are the EVs coming? What type of EVs? Uh, what's the time frame? What kind of charging requirements do they have? How are those going to be fulfilled? How much is going to be a home? What's going to be public? Mm. Do we need any fast chargers? And, and what are the other policies that we need, like time of use rates? Um, one of the benefits of the UK is you have that the uh, competitive retail market. So this goes all the way back to what does the electricity market look like? What does grid modernization look like? Um, but there are there needs to be a, at least a concept from the start on how this can all work together. And then all these pieces will need to be defined within that uh, going forward as well. And there are great practices uh, in states in the UK and so on uh, in Barbados to-, so to it, start, it starts with a on. comprehensive plan. So that yeah. comprehensive plan, you know, I guess the foundation of that plan is just how many EVs does Bermuda expect over X horizon, X period, right? And of course, you know, Definitely. Bermuda can limit the number based on infrastructure and things of that mm -hmm. nature. Um, I'd like to hear from, from Fabian. who I, I just think one, no, It's just three Fabian. words that I wanted to say. Three before words, you, James, just like your yeah, name. It's, it's collaboration, partnership. The, there was two words. And if you get the energy company working with government, working with the, the charging networks and the vehicles and the customers, it works. Perfect. All right. Maybe how, how are we going to um, enable this infrastructure from your perspective to be able to charge my Tesla at 1201? All right. Um, I'm glad that you asked that question. And I've been waiting for a chance to chime in. <laughs> um, I think... Um, in, in terms of the, the mention of cooperation 
um, that's going to be a huge part going to go about doing this. So I can share that internally, what we've been doing in terms of looking at EV, we, we currently have a model that, um, that gives us an adoption rate around EVs for Bermuda. So, so internally, we have developed a model. We do have a sense of what the EV adoption will look like over the next 30 or 40 years for Bermuda. And the model not only looks at the, the increased capacity and energy requirements on the network, but also we go into more detail to look at how the adoption rate looks like, what it looks like for the different vehicle classes um, in Bermuda. So that, that's kind of one of the first starting point for us. But I will say that, you know, in addition to, to work that's been done internally um, by the utility, there's also a huge need for us to collaborate different stakeholders and interest groups in Bermuda. It, it, it cannot be a case that the utility is thinking, um, are looking at um, enabling infrastructure in and of ourselves. There, there is certainly a need for that engagement, for that collaboration. Um, as, we, as we further develop our, our capacities to, um, to develop what these EV rates will look like, we're also doing some internal modeling to look at what the impact of EVs will look like around the network. And that's especially why we need to have these discussions with, with, um, with our stakeholders. We need to get a sense of what, what will be the, the sort of issues we'll, we'll have to contend with in terms of network congestion, in terms of power quality. But that, that certainly, you know, and, and I'm going to keep driving this point home, it has to be done as a collaborative effort. So there are steps that are already being taken internally to develop that plan in terms of how we're going to um, adopt and enable EVs. But I think that the big piece that we still need to discuss and get into certainly is just that, 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 that engagement across all the groups so that that done in a, in a coherent um, fashion and one that makes sense for Bermuda. Thanks, Fabian. I'm giving you my round of applause through, through uh, Zoom. Um, I'd like to give a round of applause to, to everybody on this panel. Um, obviously, we needed at least another hour to go through all this because it's uh, contrary to what I thought. It was an exciting discussion. Um, so we are going to hand this back over to David Gums. Um, and I know we are not done. We've got um, a quick breakout room for, for folks as well. So the, the discussion will continue. So David, 